On October the 26th, 1859, on the last leg of her 60-day journey from Melbourne to Liverpool, the Royal Charter was wrecked in one of the worst storms ever to hit Britain. 497 people drowned. No women or children survived. The loss of life was immense, but so too was the amount of gold on board. Over 130 million Australian dollars worth lost at sea, and some of it still lies beneath. She's wrecked just over there. Now world champion gold hunter Vince Thurkettle is on a mission. Should be good, fingers crossed. To recover the Royal Charter's lost treasure. Beautiful. <laughs> and discover who might have owned it. Who wore this ring? If we could find that out, I'd be amazed. To solve the mystery. 68.5 million. Vince travels from the bottom of the ocean. Oh, the deep blue sea. I'm never sure if I like it or not. All the way to Australia. 23 minutes before 8 on 3AW. Adventure, romance, wealth, tragedy. And you would like to find someone who... Anyone who had a relative on that ship, it would be fantastic. In the archives and in the footsteps Thank of the past... Support. We've got another descendant. I'm a great, great, great nephew. Vince meets the relatives of those who perished. If he lost seven million pounds of the gold, there's a good chance I found some bits of it. And uncovers the true story... This is a picture of a gravestone. ..of a tragedy that still resonates through the ages. You can't believe after all these years, this is part of my family. <laughs> That's the ultimate. In East England's Thetford Forest, Vince Thurkettle is a woodsman and author. In winter, he writes books and chops trees. But what really fires his imagination is treasure. It's just boyhood stuff. Everyone's read Treasure Island, and the hunt for treasure is somewhere in everyone, I think. It's pretty easy to get gold fever, you know. Gold is life. Over the years, Vince has been twice crowned gold panning champion of the world and has searched for gold on every continent. But his favorite hunting ground is closer to home, the Isle of Anglesey's rocky coastline in North Wales, where the Royal Charter was wrecked over 150 years ago. According to Vince, there's treasure beneath the waves. Oh, that's a beauty. The Royal Charter grew in my mind as a place where there may be gold dust everywhere. There's much more shipwreck over towards me. Bits of the Royal Charter look ribs. And then once I started reading up on it and got more and more interested, I realised that the wreck was much, much more than simply a halo of gold dust. It was massively important um, from every point of view. Not, the whole of British history is wrapped up in that one shipwreck. British and Australian history too. And in the middle of the 19th century, one thing united these distant countries, gold. The 1850s is a phenomenal decade uh, for Australia, indeed, in, in, in world history because of what happened uh, through the Australian gold rushes. Uh, it is the age of gold. The official discovery of the Victoria goldfields in 1851 was a defining moment. As word spread, tens of thousands of immigrants sailed to this southern Australian state, hoping to dig up fortunes. It's estimated that there are about 140,000 people um, from the British Isles in the Victorian goldfields by the end of that decade. To transport the prospectors back and forth, great ships were built. One of the greatest was the Royal Charter. Weighing over 2,700 tonnes, she was a state-of-the-art clipper, watertight and iron-hulled. Powered by both steam and sail, she was designed for fast transcontinental travel. 
Her owners boasted she could make Britain to Australia in less than 60 days. For ships making that gold rush run, the most popular landing point was Melbourne's Port Phillip Bay. Port Phillip Bay during the 1850s was just a bustling hive of activity. There would have been ships coming in and out of the port. There were up to 300 ships actually moored in the bay at any one time. So some commentators said it was like a forest of masts. The Royal Charter would have been moored at Railway Pier, which was later called Station Pier. And Railway Pier in 1857 was extended, so it now went about 2,000 feet out into the bay. And that meant that 16 fully-sized ships could dock there. On August the 24th, 1859, from their mooring on Railway Pier, the crew of the Royal Charter prepared to depart for Britain. Captain Taylor makes a list of all passengers as they board, while tens of boxes of bullion and coins are transferred from the city's banks into the ship's hold. Officially, the Royal Charter is carrying over 49,000 sovereigns and over 68,000 ounces of pure gold. About 130 million Australian dollars by today's standards. But there's probably twice as much treasure in all. Most passengers are hiding their gold from customs in their luggage, pockets, shoes, even in the hems of their skirts. The captain signs the passenger list. He and his ship are ready to sail. But the Royal Charter's scheduled departure time comes and goes. She'll stay in port for another two days. Perhaps the captain's waiting for more passengers. Or there's not enough wind to power the ship out of the bay. Whatever the reason, staying is an ill-fated decision. The first of many that will set the Royal Charter on a deadly course. It's incredible to think if the Royal Charter had left on time as scheduled, it would have arrived in advance of that storm of the century and saved those people their watery deaths. Vince is just one in a long line of salvers hoping to recover some of the Royal Charter's lost treasure. He and his team have searched many times before. And this year, the omens are good. Normally, people dive that site and all they see is a flat bed of sand. Well, it's different this year. Nature has moved an awful lot of the sand. There's shipwreck showing everywhere and that isn't normal. With the wreck laid bare, the team have identified an area which they think hasn't been salvaged for years. We might even be on a bit of virgin ground, but that's so hard. 150 years of everyone, particularly the Victorians, but all the salvage in the 60s, 70s, especially the 80s, we're following those people. You know, all we can hope to do is find the occasional couple of square feet of ground that they haven't done, but that might be enough. You don't need much, you know. No one that I know has ever found a bar of gold, but they're a little bit bigger than a Mars bar. It's like the world's most expensive lucky dip. Melbourne, August the 26th, 1859. The ill-fated Royal Charter finally departs for Britain, carrying some 520 passengers and crew. Each one's experience of the journey is relative to the price they paid for their ticket. For 16 guineas, most are travelling in steerage, sleeping in communal dormitories in the bowel of the ship. At night, they drink and gamble in the stench of the ship's toilets and in the company of the rats.
75 guineas buys you a first-class ticket in After Saloon. The richest passengers can each claim 40 cubic feet of space. They have private cabins with windows. For them, the ship is a floating five-star hotel. By Monday, the 24th of October, 59 days after leaving Australia and having dropped some passengers in Ireland, they're on the last leg home. For those dining in the Grand Salon, the cook prepares a feast. Throughout the journey, first-class passengers have enjoyed an a la carte menu. Cows, chickens and goats travelling on board have provided fresh supplies of milk, eggs and meat. At dinner, as the passengers thank Captain Taylor for their swift journey, he promises they will dock in Liverpool and he will be starboard side to Mrs Taylor within 24 hours. But Mother Nature has different plans. As the Royal Charter left Ireland um, quite late on that Monday evening, it would have encountered very calm waters, rather light winds, but the captain wouldn't have realised that nearer to the centre of the storm and was southwest England over the Bristol Channel, ships were already heading for shelter. There was all kinds of damage being caused. In fact, the storm has already wrecked tens of ships and killed hundreds of people. And it's gathering strength. What was particular about this storm was that it moved very, very slowly. It moved at a speed of around 15 miles an hour. It took two days to cross the UK northeastwards, and this would have given that storm enough time to whip up the seas and to create the damage that it did. The captain could avoid disaster by steering the ship towards a nearby harbour and sheltering till morning. But some 40 years before the invention of radio, there's no way of getting a message to him about the danger ahead. He pushes on regardless. It was more or less inevitable that in the end, the ship would be caught up by this huge storm nearly 300 miles across. The morning of the dive. Time to check the kit and brief the team. I'll blow the sand away and then you, anything that shows. Today, there's a novice among them. Gwen Llian Jones was born on Anglesey but lives in Australia. So she's doubly fascinated by the story of the Royal Charter and has persuaded Vince to let her join the adventure. Yeah, it's all right. The team's first challenge is to launch the boat. Push without getting stuck in the sand. <laughs> then it's straight to the site of where the Royal Charter was wrecked. By Tuesday evening, the storm of the century is upon her. At 8 o'clock, the wind is coming from the southeast, aiding the ship's passage to Liverpool. But at 10 o'clock, it changes and northeasterly gales start to drive her towards the shore. The ship's engine is no match for the hurricane force winds. The captain tries to turn her sails so she's blown out to the safety of the open sea. Three times the crew try to bring her about. Three times they fail. The Royal Charter veers faster than ever towards the rocks. Now the wind is gusting at 100 miles per hour. The captain has no choice but to drop anchor and hope his ship can ride out the storm. At the dive site, the team are keen to get into the water. Right, we're ready to go. Okay, the visibility. 
quality is good. Hi Gwen, are you okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. That's the Royal Charter. This is what we've got down to. Wow. We'll start here. Okay, start blowing, Gwen. Okay. While Vince directs the action, Gwen's job is to spot the treasure. This is going to blow that way, and you're watching, yeah? You look. In the past, Vince has recovered jewellery, nuggets, gold sovereigns, but it's like finding a needle in a haystack. No, it went under there. There's some... Whoa, 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 whoa. Gwen, I'll scooter it now, OK? Suddenly... No! Amongst the broken crockery, Good. a coin. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is fantastic. 1858. Beautiful. It's not gold, but it is a relic, lost by one of the 497 who perished here in the eye of the storm. At half past one on Wednesday morning, the Royal Charter is still riding out the hurricane. The captain is so sure of his ship, he goes below and orders himself a coffee. But before he can drink it, the first anchor chain breaks. Battered by 30-foot waves, the ship strains against her other anchor until within the hour, its chain breaks too. Desperately, the captain orders his crew to cut the masts to reduce the pull of the wind. Below deck, as water floods through the cabin, it's total panic, when suddenly, the ship hits a sandbank just offshore. We are saved, says the captain. The tide is going out. Soon, we'll be able to walk to land. But he's wrong. The tide is on its way in and driving the ship ever closer to shore. Eventually, one giant wave breaks, lifting the Royal Charter off the sand and hurling her onto the rocks. The massive iron ship is torn apart. It's said that at 20 past seven, all watches stop as the sea engulfs those who remain. Within weeks of the disaster, Victorian divers were salvaging gold on behalf of the ship's insurers. Fifteen men dived round the clock, recovering 199 bars, 23 boxes, 3,377 sovereigns and over 400 pounds of gold dust. But the passengers were also carrying undeclared personal treasure. And despite the efforts of many modern salvers, Vince is convinced there's still enough down here to make him a millionaire. Wow! Fifty minutes into the treasure hunt, time is running out. What's your air? Show me your air. We've got no more than sort of five minutes or so. Yeah? All right, that's all right. The air tanks are pushing empty. I saw something. Over the rock there, natural and lifelike. Gwen must keep her eye on the prize. Gold is twice as heavy as iron. It can sink quickly and disappear out of reach. Move these rocks. You need a knife to get it out. Will your snuffer bottle work? No way! <laughs> oh, God! That is beautiful. Wow! A tiny piece of treasure with a big story. Beautiful. That is wonderful. <laughs> 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 
The Gwen screaming down there for the last half hour. What a racket! There it is, the nugget of gold. Can you see it? Right in the bottom there. Yeah. So the guy who found that may have found it with a gold pan, or he may have just picked it up. He's walking through a little valley, and that was glinting in the Australian sun, and he would have been pleased because once you got one of those, you're going to get a lot more. And that is a fantastic example. The wrecking of the Royal Charter made headlines the world over. Charles Dickens visited the site of the wreck and wrote about it in his book, The Uncommercial Traveller. The hero of Dickens' story was Stephen Roos Hughes, rector of St Gathgod Church, which stands three miles or so from where the Royal Charter sank. Hughes was duty-bound to deal with any bodies washed up within the parish and took his responsibilities seriously. Writing over a thousand letters to the bereaved, he turned the house of God into a house for the dead. In the churchyard are the graves of entire families drowned at sea. Could their lost histories have finally been unearthed? we have had the best week ever. We really have. Above the exact spot where the Royal Charter was wrecked, the crew have called time on this year's expedition. We've had good clear seas, flat seas, sunshine. The, we've really, really enjoyed it and we've found so many things. Probably my favorite thing which is surprising, is this lump of lead. This was used to work out how deep it was and what was on the bottom. They had a bit of sticky wax in there and the sailors could drop this down, it hits the bottom and um, is there sand, shell, stones, whatever's on the bottom, the skipper then knows whether he can anchor there safely. There's no doubt that the captain would have wanted to know the depths as he's coming in. We may have found it where the last depth sounding was taken, who knows. There are personal artefacts too, providing clues about the passengers who sailed aboard the ship. What's different about this one is it has the name right across the top. We've never had that before. We've got Edward Bennett, 1858. That will be wonderful to follow up. Who was Edward Bennett? Now, I love all this stuff, I genuinely do, but I am a gold prospector, so we'll go for the good box. Look at this. This is what the Australian Victoria Gold Rush was all about. This gold is such high quality, it's almost pure, which around the world is rare. And the most beautiful piece of all. This tells probably more of a story than everything else put together. Very rich, beautiful stones, but the thing is the size of it. I've not got little fingers, but look at that. I cannot begin to get that ring on my fingers. Is this a wealthy miner who was giving gold and diamond rings to his children, to his little girls, or is this his wife or girlfriend who was such a slender little thing that that would fit on her fingers? Who owned that? And if we could find that out, I'd be amazed. Answering his own questions will be Vince's next big challenge. What I'm really, really excited about, and again with an Englishman it maybe doesn't show, but I am truly... See, I've got butterflies now. I want to go to Australia. I want to follow this up. I know the ending. What I don't know is the beginning. Melbourne bound the Salva Turn Sloop. Following in the footsteps of the early prospectors, Vince goes hunting for clues to help him solve the detective story ahead. Of all the artifacts recovered from the shipwreck, he's made a shortlist. The engraved snuff box, the curious coin, the opal and diamond ring, 
and a gold nugget. First stop for Vince is an early morning radio show. And John Burns. 23 minutes before 8 on 3AW, as our first guest in the studio is described as a world champion gold panner. Vince By Ferkel. putting the word out there, Vince hopes he can track down the history of the treasure and even, perhaps, the people who owned it. The story is about a ship called the Royal uh, Charter. Sadly, it didn't make it. I found a snuff box with the name Edward Bennett on it and I found the most beautiful little ring, uh, which has got no hallmarks. It wasn't made in Britain, so it was made out here. And you would like to find someone who... Anyone who had a relative on that ship, it would be fantastic. Uh, it is 40 minutes to wait on 3AW. He set the bait. Will he get a bite? With Ross Dinson and John Burns. Under UK law, the Crown owns all treasure found in British waters, so Vince hasn't been able to bring the Royal Charter artefacts back to Australia. But the images are good clues. It is hard to know where to start, but I think this coin is the best because it's got an address on it. In 1858, when Vince's coin was minted, Melbourne was the fastest growing city in the world. The key factor is how fluid a society it was. People landing in Melbourne, heading straight up the gold fields, but perhaps coming back to Melbourne occasionally, particularly if they had money to spend. Melbourne is the one that wins out the most, perhaps, um, in terms of the developments on the goldfield. Wealth flowed into the city, but it also flowed out. It's estimated that about £500 billion worth of gold uh, came back to Britain um, in the 1850s, and that enables Britain to pay off its debt and provides a firm foundation for its commercial expansion. In the 1850s, Australia's coinage was minted in Britain. So why does Vince's coin bear the name of a Melbourne street? Dr Claire Wright is an author and historian who specialises in the gold rush period. Vince is hoping she can help solve the mystery. Can I show you what I've got on here? I'd love to see what you've got. Oh, look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, Vince, what you've got here is a hide and decal trading token. And trading tokens were something that the businesses in Melbourne at the time issued in exchange for loose change. Okay. Basically, there was a small okay. change crisis, particularly pennies and halfpennies, because the immigrants just simply didn't bring them over. Yeah. And you're not going to believe this, but I actually have a Hyde and Decal trading token okay. myself. And the really nice thing about this is that Elizabeth Street, where this branch of Hyde and Decal was, which is just down there. Today, Elizabeth Street is one of the busiest in Melbourne. It would have been the same story during the gold rush. Lined with shops and a very special one just on the corner. This was the spot where Hyde and Decal had their grocer's business. This is absolutely incredible. So just over there is where the token I found came from. The miners went in there, they got their supplies and pretty much we're looking at it. That's right. But there's a flip side to the coin story. As well as opportunity and wealth, the gold rush brought deprivation and disease, especially for the immigrant families who landed en masse at Port Phillip Bay. Hundreds of thousands of people were arriving within a very short space of time and Melbourne just couldn't keep up. It didn't have the housing stock. Right. So they'd get off the ship and they'd go into Melbourne town, but there was very little accommodation. So single men or women might be able to find accommodation in a boarding house or sometimes they would sleep on a table or under a <laughs> table or on billiard tables. Right. But others, for families in particular, it was really hard to find somewhere to yeah. stay. So there was sprung up just behind here in South Melbourne something called Canvas Town. And Canvas Town was like a slum shanty town made of tents. And this was for the overload of immigrants who had nowhere to go. And it was a pit of disease. 
What are my chances of actually finding someone who was on the charter and may have lost something that I'd found? Not impossible, but certainly very difficult. I, the, right. the thing is that the person's name that you might have, may have he may have been on the ship, but his name might have been flipped around, Christian name first or second, <laughs> half of it cut yeah. off, or he might have actually been on the ship, but his name was never recorded for some reason. If Vince wants to find out who owned his pieces of Royal Charter treasure, he'll have to dig deep. In Melbourne's Victorian archives are a hundred kilometres of shelves stacked with documents relating to the state's history, including lists of ships that sailed from Melbourne in the 1850s. Here we are, with the list of the Royal Charter. This is brilliant to see. This is brilliant. It's a unique insight into the lives of those who went down with the ship. Minor, 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 minor. There are so many miners listed here. Also, it is moving, like here. We've got wife, child, child six years old, wife 25 years old. It, it, it genuinely is moving because this is Captain Taylor's handwriting and he's recording these people who are so full of hope at this point and all the women and children are going to die. Another thing, you know, is the ages. The oldest person I've found so far is 40. There's 24, 26, 32, so these are very vital people. They've come out in their early 20s, worked the gold fields, and now they're on the way home. Among the hundreds listed, Vince is looking for one man in particular, who engraved his name on the snuff box recovered from the wreck. It's a simple copper box, property of a third-class passenger, perhaps. Well, there's a name a bit like Bennett there, but it isn't. It may look comprehensive, but this passenger list was signed two days before the Royal Charter sailed. The only copy to include the names of all the late arrivals went down with the ship. Maybe Edward Bennett was one of the last to board. I'm near the end of the list. And there is no sign of Edward Bennett. That's the end of the list. He's not here. Edward is perhaps lost to history. But there's another document that paints a far more accurate picture of the Royal Charter's cargo. This is recording 68,510 ounces of gold. We've got an old value here, but I can use the ounces to work it out. Gold's thousand pounds an ounce at minutes a thousand years. So that's sixty eight point five million pounds. Now this is just the gold, so the sovereigns, forty eight thousand sovereigns. That's about eighty two million pounds. So it looks like hundred and twenty million Australian dollars worth of gold. And that's just the official. That's not what um, the miners had smuggled on or were just carrying on their person. Some passengers went to great lengths to hide their personal treasure. It is recorded, people never leaving their cabins. And the assumption is that they had so much gold in their cabin for the 60 days of the journey, they weren't going to leave it. So I think there was a lot of wealth on board, an awful lot. And it's in search of those who won and lost it all that Vince goes next. The Victoria goldfields are where all the Royal Charter's gold would have been unearthed. In the 1850s, there would have been thousands of miners looking for treasure. It's where Vince has come to find out more about the people who owned the nuggets he recovered from the wreck. These are chunks of gold with a bit of quartz in it. 
James Keane is a local prospector who takes Vince to a place that was once overrun by gold miners. An area of land called Slaty Creek, which James now owns. Slaty Creek gold is some of the, the um, most pure gold there is found okay. in the wild. So we're here. Yes, we're here. Mm. A couple of pans and sips. Right. Look at the little one, I see that. <laughs> a true prospector. <laughs> It's Vince's chance to get hands-on with the history of his treasure. Grab the shovel. We're going to see if we can find a few bits for you. And this is it. Corner here. So this is an absolute hive of activity. Yes, it would have been. I'd say there'd be a person every uh, 10 metres or so up this creek. Other than the fact it's dry. The first diggers here would have found vast amounts of surface gold and streams that ran rich with precious metal. Now, as then, the technique of unearthing gold is the same. We'll get rid of all that rock. OK, we'll see if there's any gold in this, eh? There's some gold. That's a good lot. I'd be pleased good. with that. That's really, really good. It's not I mean, that, what was that, half a shovel full? Exactly. Can right. I pick it up? You may. <laughs> you don't tire of this, do you? You really don't. No. Look at that. I think the thrill of finding gold is a constant. This is the buzz of the bright sparkle of the gold in this gorgeous sunlight, and they're succeeding. They've travelled all this way, and at this point while they're here, they're just dreaming of home, you know, and that's all part of the tragedy of this story. While many took their wealth back to Britain, others began to think of Australia as home and built permanent towns like Ballarat, where today there's a gold rush museum. It's a living testament to how a golden economy evolved. Initially, you didn't need a great deal of mining skill. It was panning for gold, if you like, the alluvial golds, which were very close to the surface. When that ran out, there was need then to sink shafts to go deeper into the rocks, where proper mining, as we would understand it, then would take place. And it wasn't just men who made good. Women came to the Victorian diggings in the 1850s in droves. The reason that they went to the gold diggings was because there were so many opportunities to employ entrepreneurial skills. So these were golden days for them in terms of being able to set up as shopkeepers, as theatre managers, as actresses, as grog sellers. And women actually, in many cases, were the primary breadwinners on the gold fields during this time. Women also became consumers of the gold rush wealth. It became fashionable to wear beautiful jewellery crafted from the digger's spoils. Of all the pieces of treasure that Vince recovered, perhaps the most beautiful is the gold ring. It has no hallmark, and if Vince wants to trace its owner, he'll need help from someone who's as keen as him to track down the truth. In Wales, Gwen made a great dive buddy. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. <laughs> now home in Australia, will she still have the Midas touch? Ooh, good job. Thanks dear. ever so much for coming. Oh, so you've oh. got a bit of a challenge for me here. I have. Yeah? By the late 1850s, Ballarat was a sophisticated town with a thriving local economy and plenty of places to cash in your nuggets. But Melbourne was where the most skilled jewellers lived. And on the trail of the ring, it's where Vince and Gwen are headed next. They're on their way out of town when a response to the radio appeal sets them on an entirely different track. We've just had a phone call from a descendant of James Russell, and he has an amazing story. James is one of the few passengers who lived to tell the tale of what happened the night the Royal Charter was wrecked. Today, his descendants still live on the land that he mined before boarding the ship. Oh. This is incredible. I'm Vince. How'd you do? How'd you do? 
do come in. So tell me, how are you related exactly to James Russell? Ah, I'm a great, great, great nephew of, of James Russell. Part of the amazing <laughs> thing about being here, you know, I've read the story, it's all in the past. In my mind, it's like talking about Vikings or Romans or something. To suddenly be sat here, facing someone and shaking his warm hand, and he looks just like James, <laughs> the man from the story. On the night of the wreck, James and his family were bound for Liverpool and on their way home. They were going back to Scotland. They got nearly there, got wrecked. He lost his wife and his two daughters. Just a family tragedy shared by so many other tragedies in that wreck uh, and other night around the British coast. <laughs> At the official inquiry into the disaster, James took the stand. His testimony really stands out. I mean, most of the survivors were crew, and I think they were a bit nervous in front of the board of inquiry. But he was, I don't know if he was a gentleman or just a professional man, but he knew what he'd seen on that wreck, and he was prepared to give a full testimony. I think the fact that all of the senior officers had perished meant that James was one that could give evidence with something of an expert eye, even though he wasn't a sailor, but having the engineering knowledge. James even revealed the details of his own tragic loss. Well, apparently, the passengers for their safety were herded back into the saloon at the, the, the rear of the vessel. Uh, a line was set up to try and rescue them from the forecastle, uh, but they were about to be called forward when the, the ship that had been bouncing up and down on, this, on the rocks broke in two and left them on the wrong half. The story of how James tried to save his children has become the stuff of legend. He was swept overboard, he clambered back, back on, in. then they all got swept in, then he tried to get them and then he was just swept away. You know, the, the heroism and the energy and the tragedy in those few hours, you know, it bring you to tears, it really would, even after all these years. Yeah, and then actually finding the body of his daughter. Oh, well, that, you know, I think many men would have just collapsed after that. But James didn't. 25 years after he lost everything, he returned to Australia to mine the same gold fields that had made him rich before. The reef was a quartz reef, which is pretty hard stone to, yeah. to crush. And so they brought in crushing equipment and set it up. So the mining became a bigger operation. Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, quartz reef gold, I've seen plenty of it. I've got a few photographs. I wonder, within the family, do you, do you have any bits or any photographs, or do you recognise the gold that came out of these reefs? No, unfortunately. Because no. if it's he lost, lost, if he lost seven million pounds worth of gold and it was in ore, there's a good chance I found some bits of it. I've got some photographs Could it be that this is a piece of James's treasure? It is, it is reef gold. Yeah, quartz. I won't be able to confirm no. whether they came out of that mine <laughs> or not. <laughs> well, you're a gentleman. If not, you'd say, I recognise that one. <laughs> <laughs> but a piece like this, I think you'd bring this home as a showpiece, mm. because he could have gone into Melbourne and changed this into coin, but wh whichever miner this was, and it's not impossible that it was James Russell. Mm. Not impossible. It's another tick on Vince's treasure list. No, they would take his raw specimen. Mm. The gold nugget. The snuff box. The coin. Each has revealed something of the past. But there's still one piece that has yet to give up its secrets, the opal and diamond ring. To the untrained eye, it holds no clues as to who might have worn it. But to Kirsten Olbrecht, owner of the oldest jewellery store in Melbourne, every precious antique has a story to tell. Maybe she can find a message in the ring. That is, by some margin, the most beautiful thing I've found on the shipwreck. It seems to me, from looking at it, it's a ring of the 1850s. Good. It's... Uh, 
18 carat or higher. What about the opal and the diamond? What does that tell us? I think that the opal would be from Hungary. Oh, OK. And, oh, really? and the reason I say Hungary is because opal wasn't mined in Australia till 1872. Oh, wow. Right. And the diamonds? The diamonds generally at that time would have come from India. And that would, they would be hand-carved and hand-cut old mine diamonds. One of the things that struck us when we found it was how amazingly small it was. It's an E. Well, um, actually, an E is incredibly small. I mean, let's put it on your yeah. finger, Gwen. I mean, you've that's got, it. It you've got little tiny technical. fingers. You know, it's a tiny yeah. finger size. Now, it's so tiny. Is this a young girl's ring or a lady's? At the time, for a wealthy family, a wealthy family would have a child's ring. That narrows this quite a lot because that makes this a first-class passenger. A little girl on the first-class passenger. Of course, of course. Oh, such a shame. That narrows isn't it, doesn't it? It's so sad. <laughs> sad, but significant progress. According to the passenger list, on the night the Royal Charter was wrecked, there were only three little girls in first class. But before Vince can get into the detail... No, thank you so much. OK, bye. We've got another descendant. Someone has got in touch to say they're related to a woman who was travelling with her children in first class. And here they are, Mrs Fenwick. Mrs Fenwick was 28, daughter was nine. That's almost the perfect age for the size of ring we found. The connection grows stronger as rifling through period newspapers, Vince discovers how the bodies of Ellen, her sister and their children were found. The names on their clothing and the rings on the fingers that led to their identity all have been interred in the same grave. A grave that lies among so many others in the Welsh churchyard. It's perfectly possible this was little Ellen's ring. Still trying to take it all in, Vince and Gwen head to Sydney to meet the man who thinks he's related to Ellen through a famous figure of the age. Ellen's father, Peter de Graves, was an engineer, a brewer and a patron of the arts. In Melbourne, he even has streets named after him. Keith Smith believes he is one of Peter's descendants. So how exactly are you related to the de Graves? My great-grandfather uh, was a bloke called William de Graves Howard. But it was family folklore that Peter de Graves was the father. Obviously, the... the Keith's great-grandfather was born out of an affair between Peter and his maid, Susan. So that means that you're the great-great-grandson of Peter de Graves, Ellen Fenwick's father? Yes. Yeah. I've got some really good photographs here that'll interest you. This is a grave from the churchyard in Mulvra, the village right next to where the Royal Charter shipwreck took place. I mean, the stories when you read about this, it's so heartrending because all the children died on the wreck and all the women. You know, I think 38 men survived, but none of the women, none of the children. When you see a grave like that, it was a mass grave. I think there's 11 of them in there. Absolutely tragic. Louisa and Ellen Fenwick were daughters of Peter de Graves. So, right? So and they're all my their relations. They're your relations. And you've got two families there, all in this big grave on the island of Anglesey. Isn't that wonderful? It's incredible. But also they have yeah. spent 20 years looking up genealogy items and that's the ultimate. Yeah. No, it really is. We've got a little bit of... Finally, it's time to show Keith the piece of treasure Vince thinks belonged to little Ellen, his great aunt. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Beautiful. Beautiful. You can imagine what it felt like to find that. Oh. In the saloon, there were very few children, and very few children of women who, who love rings and jewellery and finery. So it's very, very likely, because the mother Ellen loved jewellery, that little Ellen, her daughter, the nine-year-old daughter, it's, it's quite likely it's her ring that we found. Incredible. 
incredible and unbelievable. I can't, you, know, you, you can't believe after all these years, this is part of my family. No, I can't. Is this strange or? Yeah, it really is. It's, uh... Um, look, I've, I've searched my family history and uh, and, uh, and and never been told or found anything like this. It's uh, even if you find one relation, it, it, it's good news. But to 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 now find that they're all related to to me and you found this treasure, it's incredible. Vince has followed the clues from one side of the world to the other, helping the relatives of those long lost recover their family's pasts. One day, the Royal Charter may give up all her secrets. How many people then could be reunited with their shipwrecked lives? When I set off, I'd got a handful of artifacts. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting that much. But what's happened is I've ended up walking their streets panning for gold in the streams that made them rich and meeting the descendants. And that is so inspiring. And I really think these people would be so pleased that their story is being told. That's my treasure.